Um, thank you very much. Um, I suppose I see this as a great initiative, um, the whole fair data principles. I think it's very much needed. Um, I have some queries, I suppose, which is natural, around, you know, research is going to become more public patient involvement. It's also going to be led more by the public and what the public actually needs, especially in the area of health sciences. And I suppose my concerns would be around the actual, like when I looked at your query to find information, you know, I thought you, you, you know, you need training on how to write the queries, etc and how the front end should be much more accessible. If we're really talking about fair data and data being out in the public, you know, we really need to think about how complex we make the queries and, and how, how is, that, is that fair. And then I'm also concerned a little bit about, um, as you mentioned, this kind of, you know, there's a whole, there's an industry now being built up around this data stewardship. Um, and some of it is definitely needed. But I suppose I've also come from the business world and I'm very conscious of SAP and how SAP was implemented for business planning. And then it became more about SAP and how to, and you know, SAP is business planning tools, how difficult it was <laughs> to use SAP and that become, you know, so I think there are things that I would just have queries about, you know, but I think the initiative is, is really good. But that, yeah, make it more open, accessible. So I agree 100 percent that uh, uh, what we are seeing now is, is technology techniques and we need the technology to actually support it. So uh, the, the tools are being developed. What we're seeing actually is that uh, uh, so fair is a scale. You cannot say this data is fair and this data is not fair. It, it's a scale. And what we advocate to do is to at all moments try to say uh, if we make a choice which one will deliver the more fair data in the end. And uh, th this can be done with, few, with a little, little bit of technology. And, and in the future, when more technology becomes available for this and more of the tools that Eric described are there and are accessible for a larger audience, uh, the easier it becomes and probably the more demand we will place on how fair data needs to become. So I've given a talk at, uh, at CERN to also high energy physicists about fair data. And it is clear that in a high energy physics world, the, the high energy physics people all know the experiments that have been done and delivering open data. So searching after the findability of their data is sufficient if you type the name of the experiment in Google and you find the data set. In the life sciences, that's no longer the case. I've, heard, I've seen lists of 1,600 databases. And we see that science in the life sciences is suffering from the fact that people didn't know a database already existed that actually contains a lot of the information that people needed. So a lot of work is actually done uh, redoing existing, even, even already open data let alone the data that at this moment is not accessible to, to everyone. So we need a lot more, and I think we, we need a lot more findability than, the, uh, than the, uh, the high energy physicists. And in the future that will only grow. We will need more computer findability. We need more defined uh, accessibility. So this, this, uh, coming back to the, the story of the, uh, the, the data access committees that decide whether there is uh, an allowed access. If the accessibility is properly encoded so that a computer can already say, well, most likely you will not get access, then you don't apply. So it doesn't have to be that there is a, 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 well, a, a whole slew of questions coming to this data access committee. Well, I want to have access to the data. No, actually, the computer can already decide that there is no chance because this is an oncology study and this data was only uh, made with uh, uh, approval for um, heart arrhythmia. And so those kind of things can be done automatically. Yeah. Um, thank you for introducing the topic about it. It's been really interesting. I think that everyone in the room would agree that we'd welcome anything that improves and 
AIDS researchers and interacting and sharing data. Um, I have a question that's probably more for HRB, uh, rather. So, I mean, I think I'd agree with Eric that we need specialised people to do this. It's going to be very difficult for biomedical researchers to enact a, a fair p data management plan and a stewardship plan. And even 5% of a grant certainly wouldn't cover uh, someone to come in and do a bespoke grant for, this pro for, uh, for a particular grant call. So, from the HRB, have you interacted with the institutions? Because I see this is probably a role that the institutions are going to have to potentially fund, or, or how will this actually practically be funded on an ongoing basis if it's going to become part of a grant call? Um, we don't know yet. But uh, in January, we organized another similar event where the group was involved as well, and we invited other funders. We invited the institution and the Department of Health, the Department of Health enterprise and so on. So it was just an open discussion to say how it's not just about the funding and it's not just about new rules that the funders will um, ask the researcher to comply to. So yeah, for example, this new data stewards, and that's a question, it's not just of course in Ireland, but uh, at European and global levels, like if there are new data experts that are needed, who is going to employ them? Um, so the funders can do, maybe we can fund the data, uh, kind of the data related costs, which we already do probably, we don't know exactly how much we're doing, uh, but I mean, if you, like for example, if you need to access a, a secondary data set, you need to cost that in your project. So we're already doing that and we're doing more explicitly and we're asking outline of the data management it's just to build awareness. Um, I totally agree, it's, not, it's very much is this about uh, as well the institution. So the librarian, for example, are quite involved in all this open science discussion in terms of their expertise and their upskilling potential in terms of their knowledge in repository and open data and open publishing. So I don't have an answer, but yes, we are going to engage and we will continue to engage, I think. Patricia, in the North, which is a national research, uh, open research forum where Patricia Clark is involved from the HRB, we're actually chairing it at the moment. Are there research institutions involved there as well? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Um, it's a national open research forum, which is it's co-chaired by us now, with the Higher Education Authority and its secretary. It's provided by the um, uh, Enterprise, um, Business and Innovation um, Department, um, and it brings together uh, the funders, a lot of the librarian sectors, people who support sort of um, repositories, data management. It also has nominees were invited from the VP's office in the research um, and it really is to look at the agenda for open research in Ireland. Um, so part of that will cover data management plans, um, processes, sort of implementation um, and then there'll be a next phase of discussion of how this would actually work in Ireland. So the intention is to try and coordinate everything on a national level so that, I mean, issues that we're talking about here for the health research sector are common with researchers in other areas in Ireland. So we want to make sure that we don't go off down a track on our own, but that we all go down the same track so that researchers can follow the same process irrespective of what funder their, fund, their research is funded under. And just to add the ideas, like for example, the HRB is not requesting mandatory data management plan because we know that you can comply. Definitely not with FAIR and very often not with the proper data management plan. We still don't know exactly how we will be asking data management plan. Is it like the European Commission or are we doing an application stage? And that's something we are probably trying to work out on national level and European level with other funders with a potential pilot in which some funders will be involved. It's just that at the moment people are doing things in different way in the same country, in different country. We're trying really to um, to, to have a more coordinated approach, but it's, it's almost like a stepwise approach, and that's the reason we are talking about. We are still not acting, well, we're acting, but slowly, and similar to what the HRB has been doing with the PPI, in a way, just build awareness, talking, and then now potentially with more um, individuals involved with public and patient involvement in different institutions is probably the way 
to go and potentially if we try to even in the future national level to start to train some of these experts and potentially train the trainers so then in each institution there can be others as a cascade uh, then who is going to employ them of course some that very data intensive group will probably need their data steward as part of the team so it's almost sometimes in some program you have a data ma a program manager you might have a data <coughs> manager in that case like you have sometimes in clinical trial and crf clinical research facilities and um, for other group you don't need to have a data steward there so you probably need it's almost like I would see probably like it's almost sometimes you need a statistical support. It's almost like you have a consultancy, uh, which we fund for, for example, health economy. And some, sometimes you have a, an health economic work package, or you have you need a biostatistical support or other type of support, and you pay through running costs, not just about the research data, but also the data expertise. And so I don't have all the answer, but we, it's a work in progress, and yes, we will probably engage with the institution. Well, we are already. Hi, I just, I don't want to change the discussion because this is about FAIR, but just to flag with you that, you know, research isn't the only, I mean, there are lots of discussions nationally now about the legal environment for research data um, and the general data protection legislation, the national implementing legislation for that. Um, but there are also discussions that are happening outside the research that will have implications for research. And one in particular, just to flag with you, is the public sector information um, directive is up for review at the moment. There's a consultation on and the commission are looking at whether they should extend that from government information to cover the research area. So it would cover two areas. One would be mandatory openness of research data and mandatory openness of administrative data around research, which may be more contentious really than the research data itself. Um, and I was talking to the commission yesterday in Brussels and they're very keen to get insight into this because at the moment they're on the track that that will be included. Um, so the consultation is open until the 12th of December and it would be really useful for people to actually make sure their views are heard on that. Is there any other questions for Rob? Okay. So I, I can, can add something else uh, to the, uh, the funding perspective. Of course everybody is asking how, how should this be funded, but in, in practice a lot of the digital data manipulation, of course, is already part of the projects. So it is already funded. And the, the planning actually makes it uh, more effective. It makes it more, uh, it is maybe making data fair sounds like a cost, but I think it's an investment that pays itself back, not only after the project when the data is reusable, but really already during the project when the data is actually usable. Are there any other questions? Um, on the schedule, we have till 12 o'clock for a general discussion on any of these issues. So if anyone's got uh, questions right now or comments, and if not, I guess you can think about lunch at some point. <laughs> that's, that's <a> bit <laughs> yeah, hang on. Um, I just want to ask you, so you mentioned uh, certification of your training plans, that you've developed a training model and curriculum. Um, how, do, how will that work, or are there plans to actually have a certified level of fairness? Or so certification for the data set, or for, for people? Yeah. So, yeah, so there's um, uh, potential here for a lot of certification. And I guess uh, we would like to be as efficient as possible in all of this. Um, uh, but if you imagine that uh, you can be trained in data stewardship practices, and for example, if, if we offered training on our verification method, um, then yeah, we can consider what the assessment would look like. And if people meet those, those levels of assessment, we can begin to grant certifications for that. Um, in, in our thinking over the last year, um, we wanted to 
to try and keep this as lightweight as possible. So we don't want to conceive of a two-year degree or a four-year degree in data stewardship, but really kind of target people that are like mid-career, experienced IT professionals who maybe kind of already know some of these things and just need a little bit of training or coaching to make this leap. And so uh, we've been uh, um, kind of formulating this idea of what we call like micro certification, or I don't maybe there's a different word for it, but it's this idea that you know there are these unitary things that you have to know and to do in order to operate this verification pipeline. And we're right now trying to just kind of define those those unitary bits of knowledge or skill that you need and then figure out a way to teach and assess those individual unitary skills. And so maybe um, what would happen is that someone gets trained, they go through a series of these micro certifications and then they have a profile in a database where they're building up over time a list of these micro certifications so that at some point an employer who starts feeling the pressure to somehow himself or herself be fair compliant uh, they can then search for people who have received training and maybe have built up a, uh, a list of micro certifications that match their needs. So we're just trying to think about ways that um, people can kind of dip in and out of the training, but, but really show some kind of um, commitment to it and then have that be a source of, of data, of fair data, that uh, organizations can look for data stewards that they need. So that's, that's our take on it at the moment. Um, um, I mentioned that we developed the FAIR metrics. Um, this was uh, a very nice effort that was done mainly by the heavy lifting by some of the guys in the technology development of the FAIR data point. Um, and like I said, you know, if you post your data on a FAIR data point, these algorithms can kind of kick in and automatically give you an assessment of the FAIR data. I can imagine working out a scoring mechanism or a kind of yeah, a scoring mechanism, maybe above some threshold, you are then certified at some level of fairness. Um, all this is wide open right now, all to be discussed and defined by key players. So in the Netherlands, we actually uh, just started a group uh, that we call the Data Stewards Interest Group. And it's just people that say, well, I'm a data steward coming together to discuss what, what actually this job entails. And what we found out is that in some institutes there are uh, institutional data stewards <coughs> and project-bound data stewards, so really people that are in a project doing data stewardship, who don't know from each other that they exist. So it's, it's that new. Pe people really are trying to define what does data stewardship mean, what, what is the job data steward actually, uh, and what is your job if you're a data steward. And uh, it is such a wide job, that's, that's what, what I try to say in my uh, talk as well. Uh, the data steward doesn't know everything about data stewardship, but a data steward in an institute, whether he is active for the whole institute or for a project, should know what kind of data services are available, who knows what in the institute. And uh, the, there are services, of course, like the library, uh, like the IT departments that have a standard service uh, uh, task in every institute. But data stewardship is much more than that. I'm, uh, if you ask somebody from the IT department on how to store uh, big BAM files in a, in a Hadoop cluster, the, the IT department doesn't know that. It is the people that work with genetic data every day that know that you shouldn't store BAM files in a Hadoop cluster. And you, you just need all that expertise together. And a data steward, for me, is somebody who knows where to find that information. I have a question for Rob. You mentioned something about the data, ma data management of stewardship plan that, like at the moment, some people are developing at the beginning of the project um, and some people like in the Horizon 2020, they need to present as my, kind of one of the deliverables six months later, but you say you don't agree with, uh, so it's almost like you probably mentioned something that there has to be a, a kind of work, a work in progress. Can you ex expand a bit more? Yeah, so um, it's really that, that, that idea from war 
that if you make a plan for uh, a fight, that when you actually hit the battlefield, it, it doesn't work that way. So what you find out when you're making a data stewardship plan is that you don't have all the information ready. So uh, in a lot of data stewardship plan questionnaires, there are things like, where, uh, what's the volume of your data? You may not actually know that because a part of the, uh, of the, uh, the project is actually finding out how large your sample size should be. Or uh, you don't, the question, one of the questions could be, what is the repository where you're going to submit your data? And that may depend on the outcomes. Uh, so you actually cannot know that. So there are some things that you cannot know or that you don't know when you're making the data management plan in the beginning. So then you can only say, I will take that decision later. And actually making that decision later actually makes sense then. And there are other places where things don't go according to plan. And you actually have to change your, uh, your way of working. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you started working on uh, the, uh, the, the, the grid in Europe with grid computing and using uh, large numbers of computer, uh, computers all over uh, Europe. And then halfway your project, uh, there was something new coming out, which is called cloud computing. And now, now you actually start changing your procedures, you start changing how you make your backups, how you guarantee the security of your data. And this is written in your data management plan. It would be stupid to say, well, we planned three years ago at the beginning of the project to use these computers which are behind bars and that's their m way of security. But now there is a much better computer cluster available to, for us to work on and we can't use it because it's not written in our data management plan. You actually have to make, be able to say, we are going to do things differently than we planned. And what is the most dangerous uh, process would be that you say, we have a plan, but we're not doing it that way anyway. So it's, it's really a necessity to have somebody in the project that monitors whether the data management plan is actually followed up. Uh, as a user of secondary data, I think this is a fabulous initiative. In fact, I've sometimes been quite frustrated by how, how opaque secondary data actually can be to collect, particularly the metadata. And I wonder if you've given any thoughts to how you can incentivize good behavior here to ensure that secondary data is used to benefit society and not individuals or research clusters or research teams. Yeah, so uh, every, every piece of data, whether it's primary data or secondary data, should really become fair. And uh, yeah, we, we want it to be reusable, of course. Um, whether the, the data comes out of a machine or comes out of, uh, of modeling, uh, for, for me, I, it doesn't really make a difference, as long as there is a, a conclusion. And even the conclusion itself can be stored as data. I'm, I really advertise that we shouldn't only write up our most important conclusions in papers because those papers are not fair. Because those papers are only human readable and not computer readable. And this was an explicit requirement for fair. It has to be computer readable, otherwise we cannot scale in the end. So one thing about fair data is that everything has unique identifiers. So it should be possible that, that your secondary data becomes citable again. And if it should be taken up and used, that could mean more citations for the author of that data. So um, also kind of baked into the, to the FAIR principles is this idea that you can incentivize um, kind of academic level requirements because uh, people can just get more citations because their stuff is getting found more often. by giving more generous budgets to accomplish the archiving of data after it's been collected. Or in other ways, you can punish a research group who collects data and then doesn't archive the data. I wonder, do you have examples of this type of thing? You know, I, I was thinking about how this can actually be accomplished, because some people might look at this and go, ethically, it's really good, but practically, how it's going to be accomplished if you're talking about taking 25% of my budget, how are you going to do it? If, if funders don't want to fund it, and, and academic teams may think, well, 25% of the budget, I don't know if that equates to 25% of the time. Um, 
they might just think that becomes an impediment to doing good research. So, as I said, I think this is a great initiative, but I, I do think we need to think hard about how it's going to be accomplished in, in real and pragmatic terms. So, so I'm, I'm not really a uh, fan of disincentivizing uh, uh, things. Um, uh, although, uh, when I was working in industry, uh, we were uh, working on an American grant at some point, and uh, I, I was used to Dutch granting uh, system, and in the Dutch granting system, you have to do very, very frequent reporting, and they, you're being monitored all the, all, all along during uh, the process. And in the U.S., that was absolutely not the case. So I, I asked my U.S. colleagues how that worked, and they said, "Well, you know, in the end, if we don't do what we promise, we'll never get a grant again." Uh, there was, of course, a disincentivized <laughs> uh, bad behavior uh, uh, way. Um, there is an incentive problem, of course, because a lot of uh, researchers are, uh, by their deans, uh, incentivized to make great publications with high, large age factors and not to, uh, to, to publish data sets and publish data sets early. In, in the future, maybe that changes. I think if data really is citable and it is regular to cite it, then people will want to be cited on their data. And just like with your research papers, there is a risk that you're, if you delay publication of your data set, that your data set is going to be scooped. There's somebody else that has an as good Parkinson data set, and they actually publish first. And they will always be cited and, and used, and your data set will always be secondary. So that's, that's a, a, positive, a, a pot potential positive in, in <coughs> incentive. And, there, there are more incentive problems, of course. Uh, for the people that are developing the technologies or the standards, there's also a, an incentive problem because, of course, you can write a nice paper about a new standard that you made. You cannot write a nice paper if you use an existing standard. Of course, it's much better for science if everybody uses existing standards rather than inventing their own. So this, this is a part of the problem that we're still uh, dealing with and that the Research Data Alliance is fighting with uh, in all its glory, yes. Hi, I just wanted to ask a question about the timing of when you share your data set because I think that's a crucial issue that you haven't said much about so far. Um, and I think, you know, we're all, myself included, guilty of holding on to data sets, thinking I'll go back and I'll do some further analysis on that when I have time. And I'm just wondering, is there a way of incentivizing early sh sharing of data rather than late sharing of data? So, so the scooping is, of course, one, uh, one possibility. If, if somebody else publishes data first, that would, would harm you. So that's an incentive to, uh, to publish early. Uh, there are different definitions of open science and open data. Uh, and there are actually people that are uh, so open with their data that uh, every time they collect something, it immediately becomes available. And people even Twitter about all the operations that they're that they making. And some of these groups that are uh, using those techniques, they're saying, this really benefits us because using uh, the, the twi we Twitter the incentives that we have uh, for w what we want to start doing with our data. And people say, well, uh, if you are doing that, then also try this. And thereby, our research questions are actually better. And we actually get better results. And there's another aspect, and that is, that is you, you're saying, we go back to our own data when we have time. This is also when you have funding. And it is, um, you probably are more likely to get funding to do that than somebody else if it's your own data in your own field. Uh, what we are talking about here now is the reuse of data, not necessarily for the purpose that you intended it for. And uh, an example that I've heard uh, from uh, biobanking is uh, you can make an, a chest x-ray and you can use that to, to uh, study the spine. You're maybe studying the spines of, uh, on lots of x-ray pictures. But on an x-ray picture of the torso, there is also the aorta. And other people that are doing the research on the aorta may be able to use that. And that doesn't harm you. Mm. And, and it, what we see is that it's very hard for a researcher that is collecting a data set to see all the other possibilities. 
you only see the possibilities in other people's data sets. Thank you. And sorry, just one other question, if I might. Um, you're talking primarily about uh, publicly funded research here, I think. Is, it an, is there any plan or is it within your horizons to look at uh, industry funded research and trying to get that data shared or is that a step too far? So we are actually, and, and Eric is much closer to that than I am, uh, we are actually working with industry partners. Uh, industry partners want to have their own data inside the company fair because they have the problem that they cannot find their own data back. So they, they have no intention of sharing that with anyone outside of the company, but they want to make it fair inside. So, so again, it's the A in fair, just saying, hey, you know, uh, what's, what's the level of accessibility? And maybe it's, yeah, I don't want anybody to see this, but internally, it's going to help me run my project better. And it, uh, the larger the company, the more they're interested in this particular uh, business case, I would say. Just to add really quickly to that, I mean, there's a, a 2018 data package that will is in planning at the moment, will come out in 2018 from the Commission, and it will bring together all of the policy on research data, business data, and government data. Um, so their intention is to bring all of that data together into one and look at how that can work within the European Open Science Cloud. In, I'll just mention, I, I put up on the slide, um, you'll see lots of examples of data excuse bingo if you, if you Google it. Um, but I think, we, I, mean, I think we all recognize a lot of these, um, these excuses, but they're based on an existing incentivization scheme. So just because the discussion was centering around incentives, um, I thought I would put that up. Yeah, th thanks very much. This all makes so much sense uh, to me anyway. Um, but what I'm struggling with is really how we start to operationalize this in our work now without having to wait for these data stewards to come along. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are things like um, networking providers like ResearchGate, who are always uh, asking you to put in your data sets, are they moving towards providing services to verify and at least partially your data? Oh, uh, it definitely helps. Uh, Figshare, uh, Dryad, they're, they're all service providers that provide part of the uh, FAIR principles to you. So they, they can assign uh, a persistent identifier and the FAIR principles demand that you use a, fair, a persistent identifier. Uh, I also know that uh, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the repository owner, gen generic repository owners, they are working together also to assess fairness uh, and help researchers deposit FAIR data into their repository. Of course, a part of the fairness comes from the repository. For instance, the longevity of the repository is essential for fairness. But some of the qualities are really inside the data set and, and cannot be influenced by, why, by, by where you uh, store the data. Um, I will go uh, more into detail of some, some of the examples in the afternoon uh, session. In, in the, the paper that I, I showed briefly on the fair metrics, uh, we cite, I think, two or three um, previous attempt or existing attempts to gauge the fairness of a repository. Uh, the group at TU Delft, at Technical University in Delft in the Netherlands, uh, I think they've evaluated 37 different repositories in a, a fairly qualitative way, but for the, the, the 15 fair principles. And so it's, it's an example of how you can start thinking a little bit more concrete about your level of fairness and then maybe triaging uh, you know, what are the, the things you have to do to become more fair? And what are the simple things I can do right now versus maybe the longer term projects? 